today to have Paolo Giordani uh, from the Riggs Bank uh, talk about up the stairs, down the elevator, valuation ratios, and shape predictability in the distribution of stock returns. Uh, uh, Paolo, the floor is yours. Thanks. I will try to finish in uh, 45 minutes or so, so that we have some time for uh, for discussion. This is uh, joint work with Michael Hulling at the Swedish House of Finance. Is Michael is more of the finance guy. My main interest is uh, econometrics and uh, statistics, so I will try to talk more of uh, what I know more about. And I will also try and emphasize points that hopefully will be of more general interest. So I will say something that uh, might be interesting for people who are, all, who are doing macro. But the paper is about uh, uh, asset pricing. And we, um, we try to contribute at the intersection of two literatures. One on uh, predictability of uh, aggregate equity returns uh, and following a literature that is just uh, too big to, to mention here. Uh, typically in the literature, uh, we have uh, a simple regression where equity returns are regressed on a valuation ratio. The most famous is uh, Schiller's Cape, but price to book, price to sale, market cap to GDP, Tobin's Q, and five years returns have also been used, and as well as many other variables. And the other literature that we refer to talks about skewness of uh, uh, market returns, uh, both unconditionally and conditionally on um, a set of uh, variables. Our contribution is to uh, use a simple model so that we can look at the entire distribution of stock index returns. So unlike quantile regression, we don't isolate a particular quantile or we don't consider only the mean or only the skew. We're trying to plot the entire distribution of stock returns. And we're also looking, therefore, at the full range of possible valuation levels. So this is not about uh, this is not a paper about crashes. We're we're only interesting interested in high valuations, but we consider uh, every possible valuation levels. Um, we're not claiming to uh, to um, be doing anything extraordinarily novel in the sense that. Uh, the financial industry is very well aware that there is a link between valuation levels and the shape of the predictive distribution. So up the stairs, down the elevator is a common uh, trader's adage, or the more recent uh, uh, up the escalator, down the parachute is another one. And uh, Mark Spitznagel, who runs a very well-known hedge fund, has been writing about the fact that crashes follow distortions, high valuations. He's looking at the tail and claims that high valuations are associated with uh, fatter left tails. Then I have a quote from George Soros from the 80s. Uh, boom, the boom is long and drawn out and the bust is short and steep. And finally, my favorite, from Stanley Druckenmiller, one of the most uh, successful hedge fund managers of all time. A high valuation only tells me how much the stock can fall once a catalyst set in, which really shows a strong degree of nonlinear thinking. So a high valuation doesn't tell him that he should short the stock now. It's not a directional prediction. It, uh, it tells him how much room there is to fall once the fall occurs. And that's not something that you can easily capture with a linear regression. Uh, there is also uh, some uh, theoretical uh, literature trying to link valuations with an asymmet asymmetric uh, distribution. Uh, the simplest uh, might be the a rational expectation, no, sorry, not a rational expectation, but a rational bubble model by Blanchard and Watson, where 
um, returns, or rather the, the price level is modeled as a fundamental price level plus X, which is a deviation from a fundamental uh, price level in log. So we can think of X as a valuation uh, ratio. And then this is a model of rational bubbles and rational here implies that the expected return is constant. There is no profit to be made in expectation from either excess profit from either going long or short. But the bubble component can implode with probability pi at any point in time. What's interesting for us is that this implies uh, a distribution that keeps changing. So the larger, pi, the larger uh, x, which is the bubble component, the more the distribution becomes uh, left skewed. Uh, so, so this, this is uh, the simplest model that establishes a uh, correspondence between a valuation ratio and the entire shape of the distribution, leaving the conditional mean of the distribution unchanged. Now, this is not a paper about bubbles, and it's not a theoretical paper. We're not, talk we're not taking this model or any other model to the data, but it's, we're just using this as an illustration. <laughs> Uh, 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 Shin and co-authors have also developed uh, some theoretical work uh, where the distribution becomes more asymmetric as the deviation from, from equilibrium becomes uh, larger. Uh, there is also a, a related empirical literature. Um, um, there is a literature on, let's call it on crashes, of which the first paper here, Greenwood Slide from You, is an example. And the typical finding here is that if prices went up a lot, very fast, in recent time, that increases the probability of a steep drop. That is also is a somewhat weaker correspondence between valuations and returns. Um, perhaps the most interesting paper for us is this second one, uh, Chen Hong and Stein. They build a measure of skew from, uh, by aggregating daily returns. So every, in this case, uh, six months, in other similar paper, every quarter, a measure of skew, in sample skew, is computed using daily returns. Uh, and uh, the skew is defined in the most common way as the normalized uh, uh, third moments. Uh, and they do find some relationship between uh, skewness defined in this way and uh, valuation ratios. There is a similar paper by Brunner Meyer and co-author that's looking at currencies. And they build skewness in the same way. And uh, Giselle also has a recent paper. So this is a fairly common, in this small literature, but it's still a fairly common way to proceed to, co to build a measure of skewness from daily returns. We're going to do something different. Um, we think that this approach has, um, has uh, several drawbacks. One obvious drawback is that uh, um, this measure of skewness is extremely noisy. So you're taking third moments, and you're usually taking third moments of a distribution which is very fat tailed to start out with. So you can prove both theoretically and also empirically, that uh, you get extremely noisy distribution with huge uh, um, estimation uncertainty. And that's one problem. And then there is another issue, which is that you, even if you had a very large sample, you might not be capturing the large thing uh, anyway, because 
skewness in daily returns or high frequency returns more generally is not necessarily uh, doesn't necessarily have a strong relationship with skewness in cumulative returns which what which is what we're interested in um, uh, so for example if there is uh, weak dependence between data then a central um, Mm, sorry, a law of large number will suggest that uh, skewed daily return will actually converge to a normal quite quickly. Conversely, if there is strong dependence between the data, and the easiest way to obtain that is, is to have some type of a symmetry in a, say, GARCH or SV model, where volatility increases with negative returns. So it's been, uh, it's been uh, known for a long time that uh, a Garch and SV model with, uh, uh, with uh, symmetric one period returns can actually generate substantial asymmetry in cumulative returns. Um, here I simulated an example from a stochastic volatility model with leverage. So in the first panel you see the daily returns and in the in the first panel you see the daily returns and in the second panel you see the quarterly returns and it is the fact that negative returns generate higher volatility which induces this uh, asymmetry in the distribution now if the data generating process looks something like this and you are using this measure of skewness, then you have an extremely noisy, potentially even useless uh, measure of skewness that might not capture what you're after at all. So what, what, uh, what we suggest is uh, what we thought would be the most uh, simple, straightforward extension of a linear regression um, and in fact it is a model which nests a linear regression as a special case um, I'm going to model cumulative returns which is my y here as a skew t distribution I'm going to tell you shortly which skew t distribution the skew t distribution has four parameters m is actually a mode here which will be the same as the mean for a symmetric distribution. Sigma is a dispersion parameter, which would be the same as the standard deviation for a normal, but in general would not be. Uh, N is, is the degree of freedom parameter for a T distribution. And this gamma is a parameter that determines the asymmetry, the shape of the distribution. So why a skew t and not a skew normal? Uh, it turns out that in this case, the results are identical. Whether I could uh, have shown a skew normal, it would have been the same. In, in general, it's a good idea to use a t distribution for, for returns. In particular, there is a high risk with this fat tail distribution than a, a, that an outlier is going to be interpreted as some type of skew. So before we go ahead and model skew, we, it's a good idea to make sure that uh, outliers or, or fat tails will be accommodated as fat tails. Otherwise we risk um, uh, overfitting. And then the model makes each one of these parameter a linear function, a linear deterministic function of uh, um, in this case, a valuation ratio of my choosing. And I could have several predictor, predictors in here. I just choose one. So the standard model would have, uh, the standard regression would have only the first two parameters here. If I had um, the first three parameter and set the fourth to zero, then I would have the standard regression, but with, uh, with T errors. 
And the fourth one tells me that the asymmetry, now I have a potentially asymmetric distribution, which has an intercept and then can also be a function of valuation ratios. So this is the most parsimonious way that I can think of of allowing valuation ratios to affect the entire distribution. Effectively, I have introduced two new parameters, or if you like, uh, even one new parameter. So I have a skewness and then a time variance skewness that might depend on valuation ratio. Paolo, quick, quick question. Initially, I think you said you were going to do this for the entire cross-section of stock returns. So can I think of YT as a vector? Uh, no, if I oh. said that, I was, uh, I was mistaken. So okay, so maybe I misunderstood. Okay, so this is for... The S&P 500, I am uh, working on extensions, but I will only show you the uh, results for the S&P 500. Okay, gotcha. what, I, what, what I said is that I'm not slicing a portion of the data. I am not looking only at uh, uh, periods that of uh, ver very rapidly rising crisis, or I'm not uh, using a threshold to cut out a subsample as some of the literature does. Well, sorry, before you move on, could you um, talk about how something like I, uh, We are having trouble <coughs> hearing you. Um, can you hear me better? better Try it. Hey, Andrea. <laughs> Um, can you hear me okay? No. Not really. Uh, hey, move on. Yeah. Sorry. Um, in, uh, in a robustness check, I will also add valuation ratios to the dispersion. So I will also allow uh, uh, volatility to be a function of, um, of valuation ratios. Uh, I will skip this slide that tries to justify my choice of using a direct forecasting approach as opposed to specifying a multivariate model. Uh, and I'll, I'll go quickly through this, this one. Uh, there is a broad range of uh, choices for a skew t distribution in the statistical literature and uh, uh, most of these are actually untested empirically there's uh, there's quite a bit of theoretical work and actually not a whole lot of empirical work uh, using this distribution um, i have picked uh, one fernandez and steel it's that's been around for quite a long time, and it's very uh, intuitive, uh, easy to understand. It is essentially uh, piecing together two half of uh, a T distribution. So it's, um, uh, it's taking one T distribution with one standard deviation, and taking only one half of it. And then on the other side is taking a t-distribution with another parameter standard deviation. And then it's piecing them together in a way that uh, ensures uh, continuity. Now, I am not claiming that this is uh, the best skew t-distribution. Um, I have found that it works very well numerically. For those of you who are into this literature, I think this is a very good choice as long as the skewness is fairly modest. Then it does a very good job. If you have severely asymmetric distribution, you might want to look into uh, other options. But uh, what is interesting for, for uh, our purpose is that uh, our main point is captured by just one parameter because there is only one parameter that determines the shape of, the, or better, the asymmetry of the distribution. We have four parameters which are easy to interpret, the mode, the dispersion, which becomes the standard deviation from a normal, the degrees of freedom, so how fat the tail is, 
and then the uh, asymmetry. This parameter gamma determines how much mass is placed on the right side of the, mo the mode versus on the left side of the mode. So if you're thinking of skewness as a standardized third moment, then that is a combination of two parameters here, or actually three, the dispersion, the degrees of freedom, and, uh, and the asymmetry. Uh, and that's one reason why I don't really uh, like skewness as defined as third moment, because it is really a convolution of a lot of uh, uh, a lot of uh, factors in here, there is just one parameter that determines the asymmetry in the distribution. I will for now skip the part about estimation, and um, I could go back to that uh, uh, later if you like. As I said, uh, I have estimated some very complex model with uh, this QT, much more complex than I, that I will show here. And, um, and that has uh, worked uh, quite well. So compared to some other alternative, I'm quite confident that uh, this choice will be uh, competitive from a practical point of view. Uh, and I'm coming to the data. So as I said, this is only historical data on the S&P 500. Uh, I'm currently working on uh, extensions to, uh, uh, to international data. We're modeling cumulative returns uh, at the one year and the two year horizon. And uh, um, our uh, default evaluation ratio is uh, Schiller's Cape. But then uh, we will also look at several alternatives in uh, robustness uh, checks. Okay. All variables are in logs and the valuation ratios are standardized for comparison. So the, the data set we're using is quite uh, standard. Doesn't necessarily mean that it's a very good data set. In particular, here I have plotted in blue Schiller's Cape. Um, the black dashed line is margin adjusted CAPE. I will talk about that later. Um, so uh, it's uh, no point trying to hiding the fact that this valuation ratio is a very persistent variable. So um, one has to be very humble in uh, interpreting and explaining the data because even a hundred years of observations really capture a handful of, cy of uh, cycles, if you like, from peak uh, to peak. Not only that, but when you go and look at the composition of the S&P 500 before roughly 1915, we have, uh, we have uh, 30 years of data there, but then 70% of that index is composed of uh, railway stocks. So essentially, <laughs> up until 1915, all of the manufacturing is absent from, from the index. So you have periods before 1916 where the US economy is growing at 8% a year and the stock market is just crashing. And, and that, that's probably due to a transition from an overinvestment in railways to, to railways becoming 10% of the index by 1915. Uh, so that's, just, that's uh, good to know. Having said that, uh, let me show you, try to convince you that there is actually an asymmetry in the data that you don't have to torture the data in order to to get this asymmetry, I've already, I've already anticipated that yes, the data is uh, very persistent, so uh, all results have to be taken with a grain of salt, but the asymmetry is clearly in the data even if you don't do anything extremely sophisticated. So what I've, what I've done here is plot two-year returns simply for the highest quartile of CAPE ratio, 
so for the highest quartile of valuation, and we have a very asymmetric distribution, and for the lowest quartile. So here we have low valuation, and then distribution is much closer to a symmetric distribution. And there is many more pictures like this in the paper. You also obtain something very similar with uh, post-war data. So the model is going to try and capture uh, essentially that feature. Um, and here I have the model. I simply reproduce it. Uh, this is the same slice that I have that I had before. So to start out, um, I allow valuation ratio, which is CAPE, our X here is CAPE, to enter both in the mode of the distribution and in the asymmetry of the distribution. So if the model wanted to get back to a standard regression, it could. The model is nesting the standard framework. It could set the asymmetry to zero, and it could say that uh, um, it could say that the asymmetry does not change, does not depend on the valuation. Uh, you will not be surprised to find out that, given the pictures I showed you, that uh, symmetry is very strongly rejected. That's quite obvious. Um, um, also, the model where this coefficient here is set to zero, so you have a skewed distribution, and only the, the mode depend on valuation. So that would be the more straightforward extension of the standard regression. That is also rejected using any criteria or, or test. So this parameter here is the uh, parameter with the most predictive power. And it turns out, we did not impose it on the data, but it turns out that you can simplify the model and set, in fact, the parameter, this parameter to zero, so that valuations do not change the mode of the distribution. They only change the shape of the distribution. And I'll show you in a second what that means. Paolo, is this, is this consistent with the Goya Welch kind of result uh, that you basically, uh, with all these predictive variables, you cannot outperform a rolling sort of um, mean? Um, uh, no, it's not. It, uh, but I, actually, I shouldn't say no, it's not, because I have done nothing out of sample here. Everything I've done is in sample. So in sample, I'm going to get exactly the same relationship between valuation and the mean that you would get uh, running a linear regression. I'm going to get uh, Schiller results or, or Campbell and Schiller or, or very closely. Here you can see that um, here is what I mean. Um, this graph plots valuation ratio on the X and uh, um, conditional mean on the Y. Uh, the dashed line is OLS, is the regression, the regression. And the blue line is what comes out of the model that uh, I just showed you. So as far as the conditional mean goes, I really have nothing to add or subtract to uh, a linear regression. And I did not impose that to start out with, but that's just the way the, the model turns out. What, what uh, is different here is not the conditional mean, but if you like, the way that we go back to the conditional mean. So in the, in the first panel, I have the distribution for one year return, conditional on a high valuation, two standard deviation. And you can see that the shape is uh, strongly asymmetric. And in the second panel, in, in, uh, valuations are low. So this is, uh, stocks are cheap, if you like, and exactly like uh, Schiller or Campbell or Cochrane, I would say this is a great time to buy a stock because the, the mean is high. 
but, but notice that the two distributions have the same mode. I did not I impose that, but it turns out that way. So conditional on high valuation, the mean here is going to be much lower than the mean here. But that comes about not by shifting uh, the distribution, but by changing its shape. And uh, here I have results for the uh, two-year uh, um, two uh, forecasting distribution. So again, conditional on high valuation, I get a very asymmetric distribution. And conditional on low valuation, cheap stock, I get a symmetric distribution. There is no reason why, in principle, why the the bottom distribution should be symmetric. It could still be left skewed, it could become uh, right skewed. In fact, it is slightly uh, right skewed. Uh, but for one of the interesting things is that, as I said, the mode is, is the same. So this is capturing essentially the up the stair, down the elevator in a sense that even when valuations are extremely high, most likely than not, we get positive returns. But then the chance of getting really bad returns has now increased substantially. Um, uh, with uh, all the caveats of the data being what it is, um, the, the key results are there in the pre-World War II and post-World War II subsamples, and are also there using different valuation ratios. So the, the price to book has a very high correlation with CAPE, and the results are nearly identical. Uh, now, sometimes valuation ratios are not available or it's not obvious to, to think what is a reasonable fundamental value. For example, uh, in this paper that I cite uh, for commodity prices, it's very hard to think of a fundamental prices. And then often the five-year returns are used as some measure of valuation. And even in the macro literature often the five-year returns, the five-year growth rate, for example, of debt to GDP, to that something that I hear a lot, is used uh, quite a bit. Now, as a proxy for valuation, this is a fairly noisy. Uh, this is a fairly noisy proxy. The correlation is 0 0.5 between CAPE and five-year total return. So. If we think that it's really valuations that matter, we would expect the results to be qualitatively similar, but not as strong, the fit to be uh, not as good. And that's because, well, the, a strong growth in, in uh, prices can also happen out of very cheap valuations. Right? And then uh, we would, of course, uh, mix that. And that is exactly what we find. Otherwise, I wouldn't have posted it here. Um, um, this is something that uh, we don't really emphasize much in the paper, but I thought it could be interesting for some of you in the audience because it's something that you are not likely to have seen. It's uh, it's another robustness check where we are we're using margin adjusted K. The idea is that, um, uh, well, Schiller smooth his earnings, but actually earnings, the, the profit margin is itself subject to long cycles. And here you have uh, an example of that using uh, post-World War II data, where I'm plotting corporate profits divided by GDP. So you can see that uh, 
they vary substantially from 3-4% to 9-10%. Currently, uh, profit margins are extremely high and they have been extremely high from 2004-2005. So by, um, they are the highest margin after World War II. During war, the period of World War I and the late 20s, margins were actually even higher than they are today. So this is not a historical record. If you were to go here more on the left, uh, you would see even, even higher profit margins. But they're certainly, certainly high. So the idea is that if we assume that uh, these margins are mean reverting, then we need to take that into account in comparing a CAPE ratio. Of course, the fact that profit margins are extremely high is another way of saying that the labor share is extremely low, right? For, um, um, so I have done my best following John Hoosman. He's a practitioner, Ran Safan, was a student of John Taylor at Stanford and uh, has now been running funds for 20 years and has pushed uh, this, uh, this uh, measure, uh, which I will show you again. Um, he claims that this measure actually fits um, returns somewhat better than Schiller's measure, and I've been able to verify that it's true, um, again, in, in this uh, data. So the blue line is Schiller's cape and the red line, the, sorry, the, the black dashed line is margin adjusted. Okay. So um, there are some, all in all they correlate strongly, but there are some uh, notable differences. In particular, the 1929 episode was much more prominent using this adjustment. And that's because the late 20s had been a time of extremely high profitability in the US. Conversely, if you look at the dot-com boom here, uh, it looks a little less crazy, if you allow me the term, using this margin adjusted valuation. And that's because actually margins in the 90s had been quite low. Right? But uh, of course, what's uh, most interesting is that uh, the, the, most of the time, the two measures are quite similar, but right now they are very different because profitability is extremely high. So you will get the substantially different returns taking one or the other. Um, as I've said, uh, all the results uh, uh, carried through with this measure. In fact, they are somewhat stronger because the fit is in fact uh, somewhat higher than with uh, Schiller's cape. Um, um, implications. Uh, what are the implications uh, of, of all of this? Well, one is that uh, for risk management, uh, all the measures of the tails are strongly affected and could be completely wrong. Uh, there's plenty of tables on, in, in the paper. So whether you compute value at risk or respective shortfalls, these measures are very strongly affected by which model you pick here and whether you buy these results uh, or not. Um, another more, more general point is that even if you don't look at the tails per se, but you only care about the second moment, right? volatility, uh, you are still over or underestimating it. Uh, uh, so at, um, here I plot uh, the standard deviation in the dash line, dashed line from OLS and in the blue line from, uh, uh, from my model as a function of valuation. So you can see that when valuations are very high, as they are now here, standard models underestimate volatility. 
So even if you are a mean return investor, you are uh, not picking the optimal um, leverage or the optimal position in your portfolio. Um, for policy, uh, for those who are interested in policy, it uh, might be interesting, this result might be interesting because there is now several trillion dollars in the markets that are managed with some kind of volatility targeting or risk parity. Right? So this, these are measures that take recent historical volatility and use it to determine the size of different components in a portfolio. So again, if you buy this result, um, uh, all, of this, um, all of these approaches would now underestimate volatility and therefore uh, have excessive exposure. Not only that, but they are likely to be very surprised if the tail all of a sudden pops pops up. Um, something else that is interesting for me because um, I have actually worked in financial markets and it's actually amazing how difficult it is when you are in financial market not to do what everybody else is doing and just uh, go along with the index, right? Uh, even though you, <laughs> there is some predictability. But in, in my mind, this result help to explain why very high valuations are possible in the in the first place and that's because even if valuations are extremely high like in this case what is the most likely outcome for the next year or two your most likely outcome is still positive returns right so yes you might get a crash but timing is very difficult if you get out of the market no, and uh, the market keeps going up, after a year, you've certainly lost your job. And uh, that's just a fact. <laughs> and this, and therefore, uh, and I didn't lose my job like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and, and to me, this, this really helps to understand how these high valuations are possible in the first place. Right? Um, and that's because I personally, again, this is not a position that's in the paper, but I personally don't have a problem with, uh, if you like, uh, behavioral explanations. But for, for those among you who enjoy theory, you know, trying to explain how you can get very poor expected returns and a high probability of a crash or a big risk on the left tail would probably be quite challenging. And uh, the last implication I will, it's more specialized for finance, so I will, uh, I will uh, skip it. Okay, so uh, to spice this up uh, a bit more, I'm, I'm coming close to the conclusion. Um, I'm known as a little bit of a bear here at the Riksbank, and uh, so I'm going to give you a bearish prediction on uh, the uh, S&P 500, which is based on this uh, regression. So I have updated the sample to uh, the end of September, and the, the conditional mean, if you use CAPE, is annualized return of 1% over the next uh, two years. And using margin adjusted CAPE, mi minus four and a half. If that sounds crazy, um, actually it's simply because I'm assuming regression to the mean. Mm. There is plenty of forecast, uh, others out there having very similar forecast. E essentially, if you, if you assume that what has worked so far will keep working, this is what you get. It's, uh, uh, you would have to assume that there is not going to be convergence to historical valuation ratios to get something uh, very different. But uh, perhaps more interesting than the mean is the way that uh, this would come about. So the, the full distribution 
using Cape is there you with the blue line and using margin adjusted Cape you get an even more of course uh, skewed distribution um, and you can see that now th these are log returns uh, but uh, the, the tail is still quite scary this is a picture where I use all of the data to estimate the model and uh, if you want to be a bit more conservative you can only use uh, post-World War II data and then you get a slightly less scary picture but still a pretty bearish one um, and this is again for the S&P 500 it would not necessarily be the case for other stock uh, indexes what more could we do this with this um, um, I'm already working at uh, an extension to uh, international equity indexes, so see whether the result uh, hold for other countries as well. Uh, great to get a bigger data set. Of course, uh, even if you have uh, 50 countries, you don't really have 50 different data sets. This, uh, whatever happens in the US uh, uh, tends to happen in other stock markets, so we will not get an effective major expansion of the data, but it will be interesting. And then uh, the other obvious extension is to look at uh, other assets. There is no reason why this should hold only for stocks. In particular, there is already a literature on uh, currency carry trade, which use the, um, the measures of skewness, which I criticize, but that has, uh, that has, um, um, found this phenomenon and and in fact up the stairs down the elevator i think was initially coined by it's an expression coined by currency traders so so we'll probably find it there um, this model is very simple it's very parsimonious i effectively uh, introduced one additional parameter essentially that valuation allows the, the change of the skewness to move. Let's say two parameters if you were starting with a symmetric distribution. So it's a very parsimonious model, has its limitation as well, but it could be useful at least as a first go at a range of uh, phenomena that uh, might be suspected of exhibiting this uh, slow up, faster down. So, only as an illustrative purpose, with no implication whatsoever, and this is not meant to be a research, it's just meant to be uh, an illustration of the tool. Okay, I did this in uh, 15 minutes today. Uh, we are trying to explain GDP growth, annual GDP growth, and the explanatory value, uh, variable, my measure of valuation, if you like, is total private credit to GDP. Right? So this is a measure that has received uh, a lot of attention, and there is already a literature suggesting that uh, if you pick, up, pick out the subsamples related to a well-known financial crisis, then uh, that measure has some predictive power. So this is the predictive distribution of annual real GDP growth from high debt to GDP, for example, now. And this symmetric distribution here would be from a low leverage situation. Again, presented only as an exercise. And uh, that is the end of my, my slides. I took uh, 50 rather than 45 minutes. And uh, thank you for listening. If you have any question. I, I have one. So is, would this uh, technology allow you to also um, do some sort of horse race? I mean, can you have different uh, indicators predicting conditional skewness and uh, uh, or is, is this not possible here? 
Yeah, of course, it, it is uh, certainly possible because uh, I get a close form likelihood. So whether you, you do maximum likelihood or uh, Bayesian estimation, I've done both. But you have a close form likelihood. So, so yes. Yeah. So w w when I said, for example, that uh, the margin adjusted cape fits somewhat better than cape, I, I meant that uh, the likelihood is slightly higher. Uh, and I have, uh, I have estimated versions of these models with... Uh, with several dozen parameters as well with other data sets so it is uh, certainly possible to to uh, get fancier but uh, and so i would also have suggested to use this as an alternative to the sort of quantile regression so what is the sort of advantages and maybe also the disadvantages over simple quantile regressions um, um that's a good question I had uh, I had uh, a slides uh, trying to remind me to talk about quantile regression but but I didn't um, uh, quantile regression can be used for similar purposes um, well with quantile regression it's uh, the model is less parsimonious uh, right because at every quantile you have to run a different regression and a different coefficient um, so um, it's a non-parametric model, and this is a highly parsimonious parametric model, the one I've shown you. Uh, you can make this, uh, uh, you can make this uh, uh, universal approximator as well. I will not go into this. You can make this model also very fancy, but quantile regression requires, in principle, uh, a lot of data in order to get uh, accurate prediction, because at each quantile you're fitting a different model, right? And uh, it's not my area of, uh, of expertise. And then if from quantile regression, you want to actually get the shape of the distribution, uh, then you have to fit some distribution of some type to the results from quantile regression anyway. But Quantile regression is a good tool if your interest is in the quantile. But say, for example, that the, here one of the one of the questions that I found that for me was more interesting was this predictive power of valuations. Does it come about by shifting the mode, or does it come about via the shape changing, or is it a mixture of the two? It would be very hard to get a conclusive answer from quantile regression. You, you can do something with it, but, um, um, but here you have a much more direct answer. But the, the, there is no reason why one couldn't use uh, uh, both uh, tools. My, uh, uh, as the years pass, I try to use simpler and simpler models with very few parameters because I find that even those uh, are often unstable and, uh, and hard to fit but uh, um, there is no reason why why both can be used and um, I come from a, a Bayesian approach I like to have a likelihood and uh, yeah that was my main reason to do this Okay, I have a very technical question. How do you estimate the model? Uh, this model, this plots that I've shown you, were estimated uh, with uh, Bayesian methods, MCMC. But um, you can also do maximum likelihood on this, or maximum a posteriori, because the likelihood is available in closed form. The derivatives and are in Hessian are available in closed form. Uh, so estimation, it's not a problem. And I've, uh, I've uh, a lot of experience estimating mixture models of various types as well, you know, to try and get uh, the skewness of things and, and fat tails. And, um, and I have to say that uh, um, finding the maximum is actually usually easier with uh, this distribution, which enforce unimodality of course if you suspect that uh, you have multimodality then uh, then no you would want to use a mixture but if you are willing to force unimodality 
then uh, um, you're going to get, uh, you will have an easier time finding the mode here. Um, there can still be, there can still be multimodalities and issues in some cases. For example, here I've shown you that um, the conditional mean from the model that I showed you that, that comes strictly from the time varying asymmetry is very close to the conditional mean of an OLS. So you can imagine that there, is a, there can be high correlation between various parameters. Um, uh, and uh, does that answer your question? Yes, yes, yes. Thanks. There are some references, uh, there are some references in, uh, uh, in the paper. The model I've shown you is so easy that uh, you can just write down the likelihood and uh, you don't need to do anything fancy. For more complicated versions of the model, there are highly efficient MCMCs that uh, I've worked on in the past uh, that are referenced in the paper. Any other questions for Paolo? If not, then um, thank you a lot, uh, Paolo, for this uh, really interesting presentation. I look forward to seeing uh, versions of this apply to financial stability and uh, other interesting domains that we uh, have in the back of our minds here. Um, and uh, I would like to announce next month's uh, Trinity webinar, which will be given by John Cochran uh, on December 6th.